Amy, it's about to be your turn. You ready? I'm ready. How ready? So ready. <laughs> Tear it in half. <laughs> really ready. Yes. All right. Amazing. Amazing. Um, all right. So, uh, so for everybody watching, this uh, this is going to be more interview style, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Amy and uh, and kind of why I chose her to present. Uh, so, so for our company, you know, we uh, we provide research services and nominations, uh, which usually ends up being like a list that the uh, that either a city regional magazine or a business journal um, or a uh, newspaper sells advertising around, right? So low hanging fruit, top doctors, you know, we provide the list, the, uh, the publisher generates revenue around the list. And an important component of that is the sales team, right? So basically my destiny and our company's destiny is inextricably linked to the sales team's ability to capitalize in the market, capitalize on the context. So I spend time talking with and interviewing people that are excellent in sales, right? And so, um, and 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 among those conversations that I've had, Amy, I would put you in the top five of uh, of of sales uh, sales people with your approach, with your experience, with your knowledge, with your evident success in the industry. Um, you know, even even what you what you and your team have been able to produce with the product that we've created for you, or that we create for you every year, top docs. And so, uh, and so, but, but I think beyond that, uh, what, what you get when you talk to Amy is no nonsense, no BS, like what you see is what you get, um, authenticity, uh, and, and integrity in her, in her craft. So yes, you know, I wanted to bring you on to, to talk, to talk with publishers and with sales teams. And obviously we're going to be distributing this content out far beyond this to, uh, to, to other people who will see it in the future. But I, I you know, I, I want to expose sales teams to a person that just knows, knows what she's doing, um, has an incredible ethos behind what she's doing, and then has process and order and organization around it that is simple and clear. Um, and so, uh, so we're going to go ahead and go through this interview right now and, uh, and, and, and talk through some questions and get to know you a little bit before we start anything you want to, you want to share about, about, about yourself and, um, you know, what you, what you value and what you prize. Uh, well, I'm excited to be here, excited to be in the same group as a lot of these people who are so innovative. And um, I'm just now kind of scratching the surface with chat GPT and have used it multiple times in business and personal situations, um, but I'm still excited to learn about it. I feel like it's kind of one of those, you don't know what you don't know. Like you don't know all the things it can do. And when you hear someone like Kenny or Jacob talk about, um, some of the things, or even Richard, about some of the things they're doing with it, I'm just like, wow, what are the things that it can do for me that I don't even know to know? <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, I'm kind of an older person, um, but I think that one of the things that you have to do um, is not be afraid of technology and to embrace it. And I agree with Jacob. I don't think it's going to take our jobs, but it might, um, somebody who knows how to use it effectively might take your job. Yep. There it is right there. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. People that are open to kind of what I was talking about with Richard, people that are open to technology and can get excited about it versus people who fear it and run away from it. Right. It's not going to work in the in the future we're heading into. Um, I, I, one thing I did want to say, um, I know that you do sometimes go and consult with sales teams and help their help them get their sales program in order so that the sales professionals, the reps feel empowered um, yeah. to go and to go and do their jobs. And I've personally sent people your way. So I obviously believe in what you do. Anything you want to share about that? Um, I had an opportunity kind of just through interactions with someone that was calling me, asking me just for advice. And you better not ever ask me for advice because you're just going to get a lot of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it was Milwaukee Magazine and they um, we're trying to get into a frequency selling situation. Um, I looked at their sales materials and let them know they weren't where they weren't set up. They weren't setting their team up for success to do that. Yeah. And um, we worked together um, for about six months to a year. 
And uh, it's made a huge change in their sales reps, their um, excitement about, you know, the job and um, their advertisers are noticing. And so it's great to get that feedback from them and it makes me happy. Yeah. And that's and, and what you bring and what I've noticed even in our conversations is you bring clarity. Uh, I would say simplicity. And th- those are probably the two things. Clarity, simplicity, order. Three things. Now, um, I'm not even going to ask you if, if you agree, because I'm telling you that's what people experience. <laughs> in presence. Clarity, simplicity, order. Um, you know, I know I know a lot of reps out there like we're talking about community. So there's there's first your internal community of your team. Right. And making that healthy and trying to help your reps not to get completely burnt out because every single year they got to start from scratch. So we're going to talk about frequency a little bit. I think yeah. one of the questions brings us there. Um, but then also community and connection in terms of how you actually approach the art of selling, right? And how, yeah. you, how your philosophical um, background for how and why you sell and what your priorities are. So um, I'm going to let you get into that uh, um, uh, in a moment. But first, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you the influences question. What have been your biggest sales influences? And that could be books, people, or defining moments. Um, I would say probably, uh, I know I never really intended to get into sales. It just kind of happened. Um, but I've always gravitated towards, uh, nonfiction books, uh, books like think and grow rich and the power of positive thinking. Uh, one of the first sales books I read, maybe not the first, but one that really stuck with me and I feel like impacted me was, uh, the Little Red Book of Selling by Jeffrey Gittimer. And it's very bite-sized chunks and nuggets. And so you can literally read like a couple of paragraphs or a page and really get something from it. It, it was written about 20 years ago, I think, but it still stands up. And um, it has sales tactics and skills in it. But the thing that I think I took from it the most was, do you want to be a winner or do you want to be a whiner? Mm-hmm. And I... I'm a very big believer in if it's to be, it's up to me. And, you know, if they're not going to, if your company's not supplying you a computer and you feel like you need a computer to do your job, go get a computer. If you don't feel like you're being trained, figure out a way to train yourself, you know, read a book, watch a podcast, you know, figure it out. And um, I just think that that's a mentality that a lot of people don't have. Yep. Right. Yeah, look, taking it into your own hands, not be, not letting yourself become a victim is what I yeah. hear. Yeah, I'd also like, I mean, Ryan Doran, um, I was obviously introduced to him um, in within the CRMA sphere and had an opportunity to train with him about three years into my 13-year career at 417. And his, his philosophies and his sales style really matched up with how I am. And so I really was able to take a hold of that. And I use a lot of what he trains in my own everyday sales. And then I do train a lot of the tactics that he uses in my own sales trainings. Yeah. Huge shout out to Ryan Dorn, man. He actually helped promote this event. I mean, out of oh, the- great. and so, you know, huge, I'm a huge fan of his work and just fan of him as a human being. So Me too. Uh, that, that actually makes sense that you, you know, I did not know that you had been trained. Yeah. 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 Love Ryan. He, he gave me a shout out in his book, actually. Duh. Uh, which uh Selling Forward? That one? Uh, no, the first book. Uh, I can't even remember what the shout out was, but he spelled my name right. So I was pretty excited about hey, that. There we go. Respect. <laughs> respect. Um, all right. So then, uh, so the next we're going to jump into um, the secret of your success, as you would define it. And some of your big achievements or big wins with 417. So take that as you will. Um, well, I guess I would like to just start by saying that before I went to work for 417, I was in a completely different career, um, but I was a reader of the magazine and I loved the magazine. And, you know, if they, I felt like the magazine was part of the community. And so if the, if the magazine said this is the best hiking trail or something like that, you know, I was apt to go try it or the best burrito in town. I was apt to try that. And so when my career life changed a little bit and I was approached by 417, um, I thought, you know, that's something I believe in. I believe the magazine works because I know I have tried advertisers, you know, or, you know, I've went to their stores, I've went to their restaurants. And so I thought I can sell that. 
And my first year as a salesperson, I was given very, very little book of business, hardly anything really. And um, my first goal was to beat the person who was at the bottom ahead of me. And then my next goal was to beat that next person and then the next person until I became the top producer. And now my goal is to beat my own number every year. And so I think that it, a lot of it comes from, you know, my personal attitude and drive, but I also couldn't do it without an amazing product to sell and a great support system and the trust and belief that our owner Logan has in me. Yeah. 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 That's, that's amazing. I think that pretty much, I mean, that, that sums it up. Right. So what I, what I even heard before you said it was you're, you're driven, which is an, an important trait in a person that's conducting sales, but maybe even more important than that, you love your product and you loved it before you came on board. Yeah. Right. Which is a testimony to even, I mean, to be honest with you, like what Logan told me, which when she shared that testimony with me about that advertiser saying, well, of course we advertise with you. You are the community, right? Like when she said that, that really is one of the seeds out of which this summit proceeded, like in this topic for this summit in terms of your superpower is community. Like if you're a publisher, right? The media company. Yeah. Um, and so even hearing you say that before you even came on, that was that you already recognized that. And you were like, oh, I can sell the heck out of that. Right. Like I, I can do something with that. Because it's a beautiful product. Um, so, uh, so, so then that that's a great segue into the next question. What is it about four one seven that makes people in the community feel like that? So, what's the vision? What's the uh, you, you know what's the philosophy behind the magazine? Um, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I our goal. Um, and we talk about it every week. Our goal, we, we restate this kind of mission statement every week in our weekly meetings is to be the most be viewed as the most positive media brand in the area. We want, um, we don't write about political things. We don't write about a controversial things. We, we write about how to love where you live and how to learn from each other in the community. Um, another thing that I feel like is different about us is that we just, we're really just trying to celebrate people all the time. We're celebrating not just our advertisers, we're celebrating people in the community that are doing good things. And we're just pointing it out and pointing people towards those positive things. And we always get good feedback about that. But during COVID, which I hate to even talk about, but during COVID, um, we got so much feedback from our audience that it was a something that they really enjoy getting in the mail and seeing their subscription to the magazine because it was the positive light in all of this, everything that was negative on the television, on Facebook and on social media. And so, um, you know, that, that just kind of solidifies that we're doing what we want to do. I mean, we're doing what our goal is, which is to make people feel good about where they live. Yep. All right. And so, and you've got that dialed in. So, I mean, that's even the way that you like, like to be able to put what you're trying to do in a sentence that you come back to continually says something about um, how seriously you take your vision, right? Because vision isn't something to leave on a shelf. And most of us do that. We come up with a vision and then it goes on a shelf somewhere. And what kind of vision is that if you're not living it out every day and, and reminding everybody, this is who we are and this is what we're doing, right? Yeah. You're a positive, you're the, the most positive media brand in the area. That's your goal to always be that, which means you're affirming, you're celebrating um, the people, you have an optimistic bent to what you're doing. And that's not every publication. So not every every not everybody looking at this is going to be able to relate necessarily to that mission. Right. But whatever your mission is, be wholehearted with it, right? right. Be only that. So, yeah. so, so how do you? How, how does that translate into how you sell, right? Like if we just get down to the, either how you sell or how you lead a sales team, you can, you can apply it either way, but how does that vision hit the street through you? I, I think it just, I believe that in the 25 years that we've been doing the magazine, I've been in the magazine for 13 years. Um, I truly believe that we have built a relationship with our audience from an editorial standpoint. And I believe that that audience trusts us 
um, because we are shining a positive light on things. And so from a sales standpoint, I feel 100% confident when I go to an advertiser or a prospect that I feel like is a fit that if they also believe these things about the magazine, that by them being in the magazine and the trust that we've already created with our audience, that it builds trust with them by osmosis and them being the mag them being in the magazine, they can piggyback off of that trust that we've already gained with our audience and already tr developed. Yep. So they're going to get trust by association and that's what you're selling to yeah. some degree, right? Like, right? I believe it. So, you know, I mean, yes, I'm selling it, but I truly do believe it. Yes. Right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so you remember Kenny talked a lot about this. He talked about relational versus transactional selling. Um, and I think, I think we need to keep saying that term, right? I, th I think that things are shifting where people are developing less and less of a tolerance for transactional selling. Um, and, and I think Kenny was right to say that transactional selling will always have a place. You know, some people don't want to have a relationship. I just want my cable bill. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need you to talk to me. <laughs> I just need yeah. you to charge me and give me the service. But in, in, in our industry, um, relationship is everything. Like, your brand or any brand that's participating relationship with the community is the product. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not just cable or internet, you know, it's not any of those things. Um, so, uh, so we talked about relational versus transactional. Um, what, what are some things that you do as a relational seller that transactional sellers would never do? And I want you to think even in, in a, a transactional advertising salesperson, because there's a lot of those, and, and and I don't. That might even be most. I don't know. That might. I don't know if it's half or three quarters. But there is a cohort of people selling that really are taking a very transactional approach. Here's a checklist. What do you want to get your ad or not? What do you do as a relational seller that a transactional seller would never do? Um, I walked away from a twenty six thousand dollars sale yesterday. <laughs> Hello. Um. Logan doesn't know that yet, but she would have, she would have, she would applaud me. She would applaud me for it. Um, it just, it wasn't a fit. Uh, he didn't, he, it was, uh, I mean, I, that is the one thing that I think I would do that a, a transactional salesperson would do. I will walk away from a sale. If someone does, it doesn't seem like they're fit for the magazine. Um, if they don't feel like they're a fit for our team or they don't feel like they're a fit for me, or if I don't think their business would benefit from being in the magazine. Um, but the the sale that I walked away from yesterday, uh, he just had too many requirements and complaints prior to signing the contract. And he didn't want to pay the way that we asked them to pay. He didn't want to submit things the way we'd like them to submit things, you know, just thing after thing after thing. And I thought this is not going to be a fit. I and mean, he already signed the contract and sent it to me. And I talked to him again and said, now, you know, I thank you for signing the contract, but this is, this is the way that we work. We want to work with you, but you know, these are some of the things that are non-negotiables. And um, he said, cancel the contract. And I said, absolutely done. Come on. And he then called me back a couple hours later and said, have you thought about this? Are you going to, are you going to go ahead and do the things I asked you to do? And I said, I just can't, it's just not a fit for us. And I just don't think it would be a fit for you. Man. Can you give me a high five on the <laughs> camera, please? Come on, man. Looking a $26,000 check in the face and be like, Nope, I prefer to keep our integrity intact. Yeah. I prefer to make sure that it's, that I do what's best for us and what's best for you. That's just powerful. And you're right. A transactional seller will never do that. Right. Because yeah. the, the, the allure of the money is too much. Yeah. And a lot of publishers or possibly wouldn't trust their salesperson to, you know, make that decision or wouldn't even like them making that decision. But I know when I, you know, tell the story to my publisher that she's going to hundred percent agree with me and support, support the decision. Right. Because what you did was you probably I protected our team. I protected team. our team. Your team was going to get eaten alive. Yeah. 
and you saved your team, man, come on. I, I, I identify, I'm not even going to go into it. I identify <laughs> with that. I understand that. It shows a, a courage and a confidence and a pride in your product. And I think, right, like that's why you're able to do that because you believe in what you're doing and you're not just trying to get people to sign up um, because you need their business in order to keep breathing, right? Yeah. Well, and you can't have a really, this is not somebody that you could have a relationship with. It, this is somebody who wants to give you orders and you follow them because you want their money. And that's just not, that's not a relationship. It's not a partnership. All right. So I, I got to ask you this because I've, I've faced decisions like that, not to that extent, but I have faced decisions like that. And if I didn't have a rubric in my, in my heart about what I will and will not do, then I wouldn't have been able to make the right decision. You get what I'm saying? Like there, there had to be, I know who I am. I know who we are. I know what we're doing and this doesn't fit. Therefore I will not do it. Even, even though all my instincts are telling me do it. Right. Cause your right. instincts are going to tell you to take a $26,000 check. <laughs> right. But, but there has to be something stronger than instinct in place. So what uh, what is, what is that for you? And, I, and maybe it has something to do with the order of consideration in terms of how you consider. But but what does that rubric look like for you that makes a decision like that possible? Well, I just my team is important to me. We, we're a pretty scrappy team. We're um, we we put out more than twenty five publications of different types and. We have like 30 people <laughs> and I, I, I have to protect my team and be sure that they can serve the clients who are actually true partners and not spend all of their time spinning their wheels on someone who's just not ever going to be happy. And, you know, if I can recognize that red flag early, then I'm going to just choose to protect my team because yep. my team's important to me and I want them to handle the clients I do have with the utmost professionalism and great customer service. And if I'm peppering them with horrible clients in between that, then they can't really take care of the great clients that we have had long-term relationships with. But see, that's community thinking, right? That's community thinking. You're, you're thinking, okay, I got to do what's best for the rep, for, for my team, right? Okay. Not, not what's best for me. <laughs> right. Or like you're not thinking inside your sales silo. Right. right. You're thinking all the way downstream through the organization. Right. And so, I mean, that's that's a beautiful thing to see. And I think a lot of people can take a um, can take a cue from you on that. So. Um, so then, then how do you prior that you, you you shared something with me last time we talked, which yeah. was the priority. Um, what's good for the is what, first yeah. thing is good for. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, and, you know, this is something that I tried to follow from the beginning when I first started, when I had practically no book of business and I needed to build my business fast. And, you know, I have, you know, the feeling that in sales, you don't ever act like you need the sale, <laughs> no. yeah, even when maybe you do. You know, I was trying to build a book of business quickly, um, but I knew that if I was going to be in this for the long haul, that I had to have that barometer. And yeah. so er early on, I decided that, you know, it had to be good for the client and then it had to be good for the company. And then lastly, it had to be good for me in that order. And I think that if if it's evident in the things that I do, that's going to get garner me trust with my company, um, but it's also going to garner me trust with my team, and then eventually garner me trust with the clients. Yep, that's very simple but very profound. So when I when I said you were the simplifier, that's what I'm talking about right there, right? Like what? How do I decide? Is it good for the client? Is it good for the company, the brand, and then is it good for me? And if it's all three of those things. Let's do it. And if it's if it fails somewhere down the ladder, let's not do it. Right. And then what you said was it what it builds, the outcome of that thinking is trust. Right. Trust with the client, trust with the brand, trust with your team. Right. Right. Come on. And so you're you're like floating on the wind, you know, you're you're floating on. There, the wind beneath your wings is all that goodwill that's been created from doing business that way. 
Yeah. Um, which which takes me to my last question. Um, you know, I think when I was a when I was when I was a young salesperson, I there was so much I didn't know. Like I basically it's like we inherit the transactional paradigm. Mm-hmm. We don't we inherit like your job is to get contracts. That's your job. Mm-hmm. Not this stuff that you're talking about. Your job is to shepherd the brand and to shepherd the client, right? And to make sure everyone wins. But nah, like most of us, most of us that are selling are sent out into the world. Your job is to get contracts. So what's your advice to the young person that tunes in, the young seller? Um, you know, the the, 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 the the words of experience that you would give to that person to help set them on the right track towards the kind of outcome that you've enjoyed. I mean, it may go back to kind of what I said just a minute ago is that, you know, there's a time in your career, I mean, when it's extremely difficult to walk away from a $26,000 contract. Um, But even when you can't afford to do it financially, you still have to do it from an integrity standpoint if you know it's not the right thing. And that's tough. Um, But if you really truly are in it for the long haul and your goal is to build customers for life or, you know, customers that have been with you for 10, 15, 20 years, then the only way is to be a trusted advisor and to not sell things that they don't need and not sell things just to sell things and not sell one-off contracts because you need to meet a goal. It's to really talk to them about the long-term you know, successes of being in front of an audience for an extended period of time and making sure they understand that. Yeah, man. Yep. And I, I love what you just said. Be a trusted advisor. Like I hear, I hear, you know, how do you get into the position of being a trusted advisor? Because that's different than a salesperson. Telling them that that won't work. Yeah. And that is probably the primary, at least in my experience, when you have, when you show a willingness to walk away from business that you could have because you don't think it's the best fit for the, for the partner. Yeah. That to me, that's, I mean, I mean, automatic trust builder for me, you know, it really is. And it's, it's not a tactic. It's, it is really just for the long-term success of you, for you and your company, because if you sell someone something just to sell them something and it doesn't work, then they just become a testimonial against your product when they didn't really give it a chance and you allowed them to do it. And we're about to dig into that actually. So, so I'm going to do a quick, quick plug here though. So um, I know you've read the go-giver by Mm -hmm. Bob and John David Mann. And I I would consider you to be a a great example of what that looks like out in the world. Um, I have been impacted by the go-giver. And so, so I would even say for that young salesperson, I'm inserting, inserting myself a little bit in here. (laughs) But for that young person who's who's trying to learn how to create a lo- a career of longevity and respect and integrity, I would say the Go Giver man that that book alone yeah. helps set the heart in the right posture for what sales really even is, and that, or what it could be, which is helping people and actually judging it by that. How much value do I provide to other people? So, um, little freebie that I'll throw in there just because I I get to speak a little bit. Um, so. Uh, so the last thing I'm gonna let you guide us through, and we're, we're, we're running out of time, but I'm gonna let us go a little bit over. Um, and, and then Caleb, you, actually, let me do a quick a quick check here. Caleb, are there are there some questions that need to be asked? I haven't been monitoring the chat. No, I had a couple of questions. You answered one, and then the only other one is just clarifying. I know you mentioned earlier, Amy, about selling frequency and how it's not just about a one-off sell, but a, a frequency sell. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah, we have multiple magazines, but as an example, our flagship magazine is 12 times a year. And so I I believe, and I don't have a marketing degree, um, but I know as a consumer, if I'm a reader of 417 Magazine and I see someone's ad in there one time in a 12-month period, I'm probably not going to be impacted to make a purchasing decision based on that. It's like running a billboard for a day or running a radio commercial for an hour, um, you know, one spot a week or something, you know, advertising is about consistency and 
I could either take the money for the one-time ad that they think they want, or I can explain to them why that won't work and why I won't do that because I understand that, again, they're just going to become a testimony against me. So I feel like um, in a 12-time a year magazine, you need to be in there minimally quarterly. Um, I try to get people in at least every other month. And then, of course, we have a lot of advertisers that are in all year. Um, but it's really important to me that they understand that it's not fair to either one of us for me to sell them a one-time ad. Yep. Yeah, that's the, a great, great question, Caleb. Um, and I, I'm, I'm actually going to have you elaborate on that a little bit, Amy, um, because I do know that probably most sales teams at media organizations can relate because the product is advertising and because um, so many people expect like I'm going to run an ad and then I'm going to expect to get ROI off of that ad immediately. And now I'm, and, and, and now because I'm not getting that immediate, um, you know, boost in business from the one time, then I don't believe in the whole thing anymore. I think we can all relate to that to some degree. Um, but the 10, it, how do you turn that down? It, it's money, right? Like if you're trying to meet quota, it's money. It's one time. It's money. Um, how have you fostered an environment where people are willing to fight that battle? The, where the sales reps are willing where, to where fight the reps are willing to fight the battle to say no, single run is not best for you, and we're kind of not just going to kind of not going to do it, <laughs> like. We do, you know, we do have special sections like a lot of city and regional magazines where we may uh, do a top doctor's, you know, one off, you know, for somebody who does cancer surgery, you know, they probably aren't going to benefit from long term branding. They want to see their picture in the magazine. They want their coworkers and their wife to see their picture in the magazine. That's, you know, that's an exception. But overall, I think it is just you know, planting that seed when you're training your sales reps and talking them through the the long term, you know, and, you know, people know it's not effective to one run at one run, run one ad. Um, and then we also, you know, we have bonuses and incentives and better pricing to run additional ads. And so we always are going in with, yeah, you could do this. And this is why I think you shouldn't. These are some other ideas. And we're taking those to every meeting. We're never just pitching one thing. Do we sell some things as a one-off? We do, but it is definitely not. We don't sell a display ad as a one-off. Like we just wouldn't do it. It's just not going to work. Not going to work. So sometimes with a profile, like a top doctors or something, we might, but yep. but not just like an ad. Off the top of your head, um, what's the percentage between frequency and advertisers that are frequency and advertisers that are one-off? In, in. Um, I, I had a slide about that at CRMA. I think in 417, it's 80% are on six or 12 time contracts in our home magazine. It's 90% in our business magazine. It's about 95%. So minimum 80, you're seeing 80% frequency in, in, yeah. in terms of your advertisers. Yeah. And so let me guess what that produces for your <laughs> sales reps. <laughs> What first of all, it produces revenue. Obviously, it produces revenue and produces commissions and all those wonderful things. But secondarily, I think from a culture standpoint, from like a, creating a safe environment or reducing the stressfulness of the environment, um, I imagine that it creates a level of peace and and a little bit less striving. Is that is that is that your experience? Well, if you can start your year off in January at eighty percent of your goal then you can, you know, then you can, I mean, we, as sales reps, we only have three. Um, we could never get to the numbers that we're at if we had to start over with every issue. Yep. You, because you, then you're just calling, you know, that car dealer ran an ad last month. So I'm going to call him again and see if he wants to run ad this month. I had to leave him a message and then he's going to call me back. And then I had to leave it a voicemail and he's going to call me back and you go back and forth with these same group of people that you're trying to get back in, sign them a six or 12 month contract and then go find another one. And so yeah. that's that it's a lot less stressful and it's changed Milwaukee magazine's life. I mean, they, 
their their people are doing more revenue because they are able to see more people. If you have to go back to the same core people every single month to fill the bucket all over again, it's first of all, it's exhausting and you just can't ever grow. Yeah, right. Because what you're describing is the difference between selling the same person six times, right? It's been six separate conversations to get six separate commitments or selling them or the work that goes into selling them one time for six months, right? Yeah. So obviously the math works out in your favor. If you are pushing back on the market hard enough to get those longer commitments. And, and I would imagine there might be some people that are listening that are thinking to themselves, I could never do that. Right. Like, like we're, our market is so used to this one-off transactional kind of cadence that I don't think I could picture, I can, I can feel what it would feel like. Right. Even trying to apply that to my business. Like I'm, I'm feeling like, okay, how would I even do that? Um, what would you say to those people that, that feel like nah, really kind of impossible for me? Well, in some ways, they've trained their clients and they've trained their staff, their salespeople to operate that way. And they haven't set up their media kits um, and their sales materials that show an advantage to the client for being in multiple issues. Their reps are because they're so used to scrambling. That's what they feel like they have time to do. They're just, okay, I just got to get three more people in this magazine. I just got to do this. I just got to do this. It takes longer to launch it up and build it. But once it's built, you, then you're just continuing to feed it and stack on top of it. And of course there are people that are still going to fall out of the bottom of the bucket, but you're not refilling the bucket, you know, from the very beginning. So, you know, a lot of times I'll talk to a publisher about this time of year or the end of the year and they don't have their editorial calendar done yet for next year and they don't have their sales materials done yet for next year well we're about to go into fourth quarter and that's when businesses are planning their budgets and if you don't have in mind what you're going to do how are your sales people supposed to how are your sales people expected to get money from people when you yourself don't even know what you're going to do next year come on preach Preach it. So what you're describing is that that the problem and probably the a, a very common theme is this kind of failure of execution, which is not a failure on the side of the rep per se. Not it's a, it's yeah. a failure of the organization or the institution to equip the rep on time with what the rep needs to go out and be successful. Right. And so right. And, and I would put that in the uh, the order. There's an order problem. Right. I think I think the three main drives in business are progress, order and relational harmony. I think those are the three things that drive people. And and order is if you don't have order, then it's hard to make progress because things are not organized. Things are not systemized. Things are not standard, not standardized. And so uh, so that's what I, I think. I suspect that's your gift. A big part of your gift is the ability to to bring consistency and order to an organization and to yourself. Um, and, uh, and so, and so I'm going to leverage that one more way. So, you, you know, if I'm, if I'm a rep watching this and I can't control my environment, I can't control what my organization does, right? I can ask for things, but I can't guarantee that I'm going to get those things. What's one thing I could do to make my life better, right? If I'm selling, Right. Every issue I'm looking at, I've got to sell. I got to sell the whole issue. Right. I, I, mean, I got I got to sell. I got to sell into this issue and, and, and I don't have anything. I don't have a lot of frequency. Barely have any. What's one thing I could do um, to, to make my life better? I guess, uh, you know, if you're stuck in a transactional sales time warp and that's where you're at and you don't have a choice, then I would say get on board with your CRM and AI and figure out how to reach out to these people 10 times faster and reach a lot more people quicker. So you're not sitting there yourself dialing for dollars every day. So you can throw a huge net out there while you're working over here and you're waiting for, you know, things to rise up so you can follow up. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I do that even though I'm not a transactional seller to try to get appointments with people. But um, I think, you know, I do, I do also think if you're a salesperson and you believe that you're not set up this way, that you should talk to the person who has the ability to change that. Because if, if, if you have a salesperson come to you and say, I want to try to start selling six and 12 time contracts more, more often. And this is what I think I need to, I mean, don't you wish you had a salesperson like that, that, that yeah. would ask you those questions so they could be more successful? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That shows that they're engaged and they care about their job. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's going to, that's, that's excellent. Um, it's and- less stressful for the company for every rep not to have to start off with zero or, you know, at 25% to goal every month. Yeah. If you could start off at 80 to 90 or a hundred percent to goal when you're rolling out an issue, then you can focus on new business and not have to go back to the drawing board and try to grab those people who, Oh, well, he usually gets in the main issue. So I'll just keep calling him and you're wasting all your time. And now you suck the urgency out of your interactions and your touch points with the client. Right. Cause now when I go talk to the client, it's not like, all right, number five, you're going to do number five. It's like, nah, we've already got you for six. I can come and just check on you. That's right. Yeah. And I, I've, I've already got a six or 12 month contract with them. And so then they're not afraid to take my phone call thinking I'm going to sell them something. I can just talk to them about their business or their life because I already knew when I talked to them our entire year of what we're going to be doing and I've already presented everything to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's called order. That's what I would call that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So excellent. Um, that actually, uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and wrap it up there. Uh, I, I kept you over, but I'm grateful that you were able to stick with me. I kind of went into um, into the next session, which mine's going to be short anyway. So I was, what you just said is gold. 